I'm excited about speaking again because the Lord has really birthed something in my heart for today. We've been talking about intentional this year. That's our theme for 2022. It's about being intentional. It's, it's what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Remember what he says? You know, we all run a race, but only one person gets the prize. So he says what? He says, run to win. He's saying being intentional. We got to be intentional about this life of faith that we have about allowing God to do his best work in us so he can do his best work through us. Run to win. In fact, he goes on to say in that chapter, just a couple of verses later, he says, he says, I run with purpose in every step. He says, I am not just shadow boxing. I'm not just going through the motions. There is intent in what I am doing. See, we've been talking about intentional. In January, we talked about this intentional purpose, which Jesus says, I believe, in Mark 10, 12, verses 30 through 31. It's loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, and equally as important is loving our neighbor as ourselves. Loving God, loving people. And the point is that being intentional is that we do something on purpose. That we are deliberate. And that's our goal is to be intentional about loving God and intentional about loving people. Intentional about allowing God to work in us so God can work through us. And that's what I'm going to be talking about all year long. So you better buckle up. Put on some steel-toed boots. Come on. About being intentional. I'm, I'm, this is February and February is the month of love, so I'm going to be talking about intentional love. Don't we like the word love? Just, can you just say it with me? Say love. love. Don't it sound pretty? Love. Love. I, I, I think of all the words that are in the English language, there's probably not a word outside of the word love that's more misunderstood and more wrongfully used than this one. And I, won't, I don't have time this morning to try to go through all the nuances of love. But I'll just say this. One of the main reasons I think that we don't understand love is because we have decided that the word love actually corresponds with our emotions. Or it, or it corresponds with our, our feelings. Remember the old songs, feelings, nothing more than feelings. We're such a feely people, aren't we? And we can even be guilty of that in, the, in God's house. That we somehow come to the house of the Lord because we didn't feel something. We decided that the Holy Spirit wasn't even there. God's anointing wasn't on Pastor Larry because I didn't feel something. No, God's word is anointed because it's God's word. That's why the apostle Paul would say, I walk by faith and not by sight, or I walk by faith and not by feeling. We're so feely. We've misunderstood love because we have associated it with this idea of a feeling or emotion. And so if I don't have an emotional response to something, then obviously I don't love it. I can't tell you how many couples, and let me just jump into this arena, how many couples I have known through the years who have separated and divorced because of this emotional definition of love. I decided I don't feel it anymore, so I don't love you no more. I'm glad that that's not the way we decide that we, that we stay together. That love is more than a feeling. Listen, love is a choice. I choose to love, and I thank God every day that Debbie chooses to love me. Because when I wake up and my hair is sticking all kinds of direct, well, it doesn't do that no more. <laughs> because there's days I'm grouchy. Yeah, I'm grouchy. She still loves me, even though she may not have that feeling. And there's days I love her, even though I may not have that feeling. You understand what I'm saying? Love is a choice. We choose to love. We choose it. And here's the reality. If love wasn't a choice, none of us would be here today because there's no way that God would love us. 
I'm going to tell you right now, God did not look down on sinful humanity and all of a sudden get goosebump feelings. Woo, there's so precious. I love them. I love them. The reality is, is that God chose to love us in spite of us. Even as it says in Ephesians, when we were spiritually dead because of our sins, selfish, self-centered, violent, hateful, unlovable, God still loved us and sent Jesus as an atoning sacrifice to save us and to redeem us from our sins and struggling on the cross to catch his breath as his arms are stretched wide, as blood and water fills his lungs, he looks down upon those who are hating him and murdering him and he says the great words, Father, forgive them you know what forgiveness is forgiveness is a choice based in love and Jesus selflessly purposefully poured out his love upon us by choice and we are the benefactors of that love. I never forget Reverend Zolly Smith. Some of you may remember him. He used to be the former U.S. missions director. He stood in our church a number of years ago, and I never forget. He was sharing his testimony about how in 1967 he found himself in the jungles of Vietnam. His back being riddled. All types of severe injuries from gunshot and shrap metal. He's laying there and he believes that he's going to die. When all of a sudden two men, men that he knew, come back to try to rescue him. One suffers severe head injuries. And the other one dies to save him. And Brother Zali said he was forever changed. They awarded him the bronze star. They gave Zali the purple heart. But he said it paled in comparison to what these men had given him. They had given him his life. He said to them, those, him, those medals meant nothing. For him, the heroes, the ones that deserved any honor were the ones who were willing to sacrifice their all to save him. And one did. And I still remember him standing here with tears coming down his cheeks, his voice still shaking as he tried to describe the sacrifice that was made so that he could live. That's what Jesus did for us. I think about what the Isaiah the prophet said of him 700 years before Jesus was born. We read it in Isaiah 53 when he writes, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and he looked the other way and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep was silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to cry him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And when he sees that all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous for he will bear all their sins. In other words, it's God's unfathomable love intentionally poured out through the sacrifice of Jesus 
us, that rescued us from our sins. It's because he loved us, he chose to love us, that any of us are here. It's because he first loved us. It's God that so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, John 3, 16. It was God who showed his great love by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8. The point is that we love God only because he first chose to love us. It's the only reason we love God. You love God today because at some point you were drowning in the sea of sin and God threw a rescue lifesaver to you. And he pulled you to safety. And now you love him. The question we have is how do we respond to that kind of love? Have you, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought? I, I, I think it's Ollie Smith. He's crying. He's, he's, he's weeping. The reality that somebody died to save him. Jesus died to save us. How do we respond to that kind of love? Because none of us here deserve it. We did not love God first. We're here because even when we did not deserve it, before we even knew we needed God or wanted God, he still loved us. And the question is, how do we respond to such love? In John chapter 12, we also read about it in Matthew 26 and Mark 14. We, we have the story about Mary pouring the expensive perfume. Remember the story on the head and the feet of Jesus and wiping it with her hair. It's a, it's a beautiful story, and I won't take time to read it all because we don't have that kind of time. But, but John 12 tells us that Jesus has again stopped in the town of Bethany. He's going to have one more night and evening with Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus before going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which we know will ultimately be the week of his crucifixion. Just a few weeks earlier, he had already been there and he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And if you'll remember from John chapter 11, if you go back and study John chapter 11, Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick unto death, but he doesn't come right away. Instead, he stays where he's at until Lazarus has died because he wants his disciples to fully understand who he was. It was just a short time before this, in fact, before John 11, that Jesus found himself in the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples the question. He wants to know what people are saying, who they're saying that he has. It's Matthew 16, 13. He says, guys, tell me, who are people saying that I am? And, and of course, the disciples said to him, verse 14, that, you know, they think you're John the Baptist, they think you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus turns the question. He looked at his 12 disciples, the 12 guys who had been with him, and he asked them the question, but guys, who do you say that I am? And, of course, we have the great thing from, from, uh, from, from Peter who says, uh, you know, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Listen, Jesus is wanting to know their opinion because if anybody should know his identity, it would be them because they had been with him for three years. They had witnessed every miracle. They had witnessed him heal the deaf, the blind, and the lame. They had witnessed him take a, a little boy's snack pack from, from Captain D's and, and five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 men plus women and children and still have 12 more baskets to send home with the kid. They had witnessed everything. They saw him walk on the water. They saw him still the waves and the wind by the command of his voice. And Jesus wanting to know who they believe him to be. He says, who do you guys, who do you say that I am? And, and of course, Peter says in Mark 16, 16, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And I love it here because Jesus affirms Peter's declaration. He says it's upon this statement of truth, upon what you have said here, that I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not be able to conquer it. And yet in John 11, Jesus delays his coming to heal Lazarus because he's still trying to help them understand fully who he is. And he tells his disciples 
that Lazarus has said in John eleven fifteen, 15, he says, and for their sakes, for your sakes, he said, he's glad he wasn't there when he died because now they will really believe what? Believe, believe what? Believe that he's the Messiah. Now they're gonna really believe that he is the son of the living God. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to believe it. Listen to me. It's possible to say the right things and still believe the wrong things. I said it's possible to say the right things and still actually believe the wrong things. Or it's possible to still doubt about the right things we're saying. Peter had made a right statement at Caesarea Philippi about this confession that he believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And yet in John 11, Jesus is still trying to convince him and the rest of the disciples that he is who he said he is. And there at Lazarus' tomb, Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, he calls Lazarus up out of the grave and the man who had been dead for four days comes hopping out. And John eleven forty five 45 says, many of the people who were there with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. If I can use it this way, this was the straw that broke the camel's back because from this, this point on, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Caiaphas, the high priest, the Jewish leadership, they all decide that Jesus had to die. Why? Because so many people were starting to believe in him. So what does Jesus do at the end of John 11? He, he slips away to the village of Ephraim for a few days to avoid the crowds, but now he comes back. He's coming to Passover. He's going to celebrate. He's going to be crucified. But he wants to spend one more evening with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And according to Matthew 26, 6, it says that they're meeting in the home of Simon. Simon the leper, or Simon, who a man who had previously had leprosy. The inference here is that Jesus had probably healed this man at some point. You know, some people have speculated that it was the healing of Simon that first brought Mary, Martha, and Lazarus into the life of Jesus and perhaps endeared their heart to him. Some have speculated that Simon was perhaps even their father. Some have speculated that Simon was perhaps Martha's husband. We don't know, but either way, they're at his house having supper on this night before Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem. Listen, the very next evening, Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem with the shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's going to happen the very next time. And so they're all reclining at the table. They're leaning on the right arm. Their feet are leaning away from them as it was the custom of their day. And while they're there, Martha's serving. When Mary gets up, Mary rises, the sister of Lazarus, and she goes and she gets something, an alabaster jar full of expensive perfume, and she comes into the room and she breaks it open. She doesn't just pop the cork out of it. She breaks open the jar, Mark 14 and 3. She breaks open the jar. And she begins to pour it on Jesus' head and feet. Listen, I've read all kinds of descriptions about this jar, about how it was sealed and secured, and they all vary. But what is certain is that this jar was full of expensive perfume. It was costly. In fact, the value is said to have been 300 denarii, which in Jesus' day would have been a year's wages. This was something normally that would have been rationed. And used over a period of months and if not years. And yet here's Mary breaking open this jar without regards to the cause. And she pours it all out on the head and feet of Jesus. You talk about an expression of love. This is it. Listen, I, I don't know if, if Mary knew that Jesus was soon to die and wanted to do something special. Because the Bible doesn't say. Perhaps she could sense a change. And the atmosphere, and she recognized the closeness that Jesus was getting to whatever was going to happen. We don't know. But what we do know is that Mary poured out the entire bottle of this perfume, anointing Jesus' head and his feet. And then she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And immediately the atmosphere and the aroma of the room changes because now the swell of the sweet incense, this costly perfume, fills the room. And it's interesting here because the disciples stare in disbelief, mouths wide open, aghast at what seems to be foolish. But Mary ignores them. 
And sympathy begins to dry Jesus' feet, not with a towel, but with her hair. And when Judas and the rest of the disciples say something to the effect of, why wasn't this perfume sold and get money given to the poor? Why waste it? Jesus rebukes them all and says in Matthew 26, 13, I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. See, the question I'm asking today is this. How do we respond to God? How do we respond to Jesus when he's already shown us so much love? How are we to respond to that? The Apostle Paul would say in Romans 12, 1, he would say that we're to give our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. The kind we will find, he will find accepted because, that's, because of all that he has done for us. The King James or New King James says it's, it's the least that we can do. It's the very least that we can do because of what he's done. Listen, because of his love so mercifully poured out, how do we respond to such love? Because God chose to love you. You are not lovable. <laughs> but God chose to love you. So how do we respond? I, I think Mary shows us. Here's what we do first and foremost. We respond by willingly giving him our best. Listen, there's no doubt that Mary loved Jesus. Jesus had done so much for her and her family. Again, we don't know exactly when and where she came to know him. Perhaps it was a healing assignment. We don't really know. But somewhere in the course of Jesus' life and ministry, Mary had an encounter with Jesus and her life was changed. And as a result, Jesus and his disciples would often start up at their house and they would eat in fellowship together. And after Jesus raises her brother Lazarus from the dead, this love, this gratefulness, this devotion rises to a whole new level. And that evening, as Jesus is leaning at the table eating, she rises to her feet. And intentionally she goes and gets this bottle of expensive perfume because her heart is so overwhelmed with the goodness of God, the mercy and the grace of Jesus, the gratefulness that she had. And so she's trying to convey how she feels in her heart. And she goes and gets this expensive bottle of perfume. It was the very best thing that she had. And she breaks it open and just begins to pour it. She looks at Jesus. The Bible doesn't say, but I'm sure there's had to be tears flowing down her cheeks for gratefulness. And out of a heart of love and devotion, she decided that Jesus... Is worth her very best. Tim Delaney in the 260 Journal says that what we love, we will sacrifice for. And I wonder how many times have we been guilty of saying we love Jesus, and yet we only give him what's convenient, what's easy, or what's left over, rather than what's best. I remember what God says to the children of Israel in Malachi chapter 1. You've read chapter 1 of Malachi and you remember he, God declares his love for the people of Israel. He talks about how he's always cared and provided for them. And yet he said that they showed contempt for his love by the kinds of sacrifices that they made. For God desired their best. They were offering animals for sacrifice that were blind, that were crippled. And disease, and God basically said that they were showing contempt for him by their actions. They declared their love by their mouths, but their actions, with what they gave themselves, demonstrated something different. It's Jesus saying in John 14 that if we love him, we'll keep his commandments, not because of a set of rules, but out of a deep abiding relationship that's based in love. In fact, a friend of C.S. Lewis once asked him, he says, is it easy to love God? 
And Lewis replied, it's easy for those who do it. Why? Because it's out of the heart. When we love and hear, the outflow is that we want to give God our best. What we love, we'll sacrifice for. Listen, we love Jesus because he first loved us and because he loved us and forgave us and rescued us and redeemed us. We want to give him our best. Not what's easy, not what's convenient, not the leftovers, but the best. The best of ourselves, the best of our time, our talent, our treasure, all that we have, all that we are, we give it to him. He's worth it all, our best. Because I'm grateful for what God did in me. We can see what God did in me. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sang about it today. Like the poor widow woman of Luke 21. Who came and brought her offering to the temple. It's only two small copper coins. Leptus. The smallest Jewish coins that there were in value. And yet Jesus said, Luke 21, 3 and 4, that what she gave was more than everyone else because what they had given out of their surplus, she had given everything she had. She had given her best. It's the story of William Borden we mentioned a few weeks ago. He could have had it all. The heir to the Borden Milk Empire. But he laid it all down to take the gospel to a far country. Yet he never made it. Having died of meningitis, he contracted in Egypt on his voyage overseas. But in his Bibles, he had written on three occasions these words. No reserves. No retreats. No regrets. Why? Why? Because he was about giving God his best. Mary, she wanted to demonstrate her gratefulness to Jesus for everything he had done in her life, in the life of her family. And out of this overflowing motion of what Jesus had done, she made the choice. She said, he's worth the best. And she goes and gets this bottle of oil. She breaks it open and she pours it on his head. First, she was willing to give God her best. Second, I would say this, which is an outflow of that. She was willing to give God what cost her most. See, how do we respond to love so freely given to us? It's by the willingness to give God what cost us most. Listen, the cost of this bottle of perfume that Mary intentionally poured out on the head and feet of Jesus was worth in today's economy about $30,000. Think about that. $30,000 poured out. Some have said that this bottle was an heirloom that had been passed down from generations Some have speculated that this bottle of perfume was something that Mary had bought after saving for years and she was going to hang on to it for a rainy day. Whatever it was, it was worth thousands of dollars and it was meant to be used in the course of years. And yet Mary intentionally poured it all out on Jesus' head and feet without hesitation as an outflow of the love of her heart based upon all that it did. And it didn't matter the cost because she loved Jesus. It didn't matter the cost because she loved Jesus. And it's crazy here because the disciples are indignant. They're so upset, especially Judas. He reprimands her. He calls her actions a waste. And he wants Jesus to reprimand her and say the same. But Jesus refuses. Because where Judas and the rest of the disciples were still measuring out Jesus' worth, she had already decided that Jesus was worth everything. So the cost did not matter. I always think about Eric Little. He's known as the Flying Dutchman. The great rugby player and runner from Scotland. He was born in northern China to missionary parents. And he himself had a desire to go back to China and share the gospel with them. But he was sent to boarding school in the UK. And eventually he he graduates from the University of Edinburgh. 
great rugby player, played on seven national teams. But he was also a good runner, so he decided to focus on running more than rugby. He was really fast. In fact, he began to set new records in the 100-meter race. Fastest man alive. And going into the 1924 Summer Olympics at Paris, France, everybody believed that Eric Little was going to win the gold medal. He trained. He prepared to run the 100 meter until he found out something. You know what he found out? He found out that the races for the 100 meter were going to take place on a Sunday. And he said he was never going to run on a Sunday. Why? Because that was his Lord's day. So he decided he wasn't going to run the 100 meter. Not only that, he was going to be a part of some relay races. And they ran on Sunday. And so he's not just backing out of the 100 meter. He's backing out of the other races. And the people of Scotland, they begin to call him a traitor. They begin to write all kinds of ugly things about him. But Sunday was his day that he had dedicated to worship Jesus Christ. It was sacred to him. And he said he would not run on a Sunday even if he was his country's only hope for a gold medal. In spite of the criticism, in spite of the hate mail, he withdrew from the 100 meter and made the decision he was going to run a race he had never run before. He was going to run the 400 and run the 200. He was willing to make the sacrifice and give what cost the most. Why? Because he loved Jesus. And some of you know the rest of the story because you know who Eric Little is. He ended up winning the gold medal in the 400 and set a new world record. He won the bronze in the 200. They actually made a movie about his life. It won the, an Oscar, best movie of the year, entitled Chariots of Fire. Remember the song? Dun, 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 dun. Listen to me. No one can remember who won the 100 meter gold in the 1924 Olympics. But because Eric Little was willing to give what cost the most in order to demonstrate his love for Jesus, they made a movie about him. And here's the rest of the story Eric goes back to China as a missionary. By that time, China's in war, Japan's invaded. He's doing all he can. To care for those that are sick. Eventually, all foreigners are put into, a, into a, basically a concentration camp. And there in that camp, he begins to share about Jesus. He begins to teach the children. He's trying to help feed people. And at the age of 43, in 1945, before he was ever liberated, Eric Little died. But he died knowing he had given God the best and what cost him most. Listen, we, we sing the song, Oh, how I love Jesus until we're blue in the face. And it means nothing unless there's some substance behind it. Because Mary loved Jesus, she decided that he was worth the best. She was, he was worth what cost her most. And when everybody else was measuring out how much Jesus was actually worth, she said he's worth everything. And lastly, she loved him so much that she was willing to give him even her crown and glory. She was willing to worship him with all that she had because after she anoints his head and feet with his perfume the Bible says instead of a towel she uses literally for a woman her crown and glory her long hair to dry Jesus' feet you know it's interesting that every time you read about Mary and Bethany you're always going to find her at the feet of Jesus she was always there. She wanted to be at his feet, to be at this place of worship, 
to be at this place of submission. Have you ever seen the old black and white movies or depictions of a, of a royal throne room where there's a king? When people would come in to see the king, they would always bow in their presence. In fact, you read the story of Esther. The Bible says that when Esther goes to stand before the king, even though she's his wife, she's the queen, she doesn't just come walking in. She has to come humbly before him, bowing before him, waiting for him to hold up the scepter to say, you're allowed to be in my presence. That's almost the picture that we see here. Mary's anointing and worshiping at the feet of Jesus. You know, there's an old song that says, we fall down and we cast our crowns at the, at the feet of Jesus or lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The essence of the song is that our best lay before him is when we bow in his presence. Mary brought her best. Mary brought what cost her most and she gave it all to Jesus and she anoints his head and his feet with oil, and then she washes it with her hair. She didn't, she didn't anoint his feet with water and wash it with a towel. She used the oil as well. And then she uses her hair, a symbol of how much she loved him. It was an act of worship. I give you my crown and my glory. You're worth it all. Mary did not come to offer some cheap kind of worship. The love that she had was reflected in how she offered what she had. Her best, what cost her most. And the ultimate demonstration is the fact. You're just going to have to imagine Pastor Larry with a lot of hair. Her crown. Some people, I'm convinced, would be content on serving Jesus off of paper plates rather than their good china. You know, a lot of us have the, the nice china, the expensive dishes. But the reality is, and I speak from just reality, is that they're only meant to be seen, very rarely used. They're more about the show than they are about the function. And sometimes I think we can be guilty of loving God that way. A love that's more about the display than reality. A love that's more about words than actions. It's so easy, friends, for us to offer God cheap worship. It's easy for us to offer sacrifices that cost us nothing. But true worship isn't cheap. Mary broke open the jar. And once it was broken open, nothing could be kept back in reserve. She pours it on his head and his feet. And with her crown and glory, as the ultimate act of submission and surrender and worship, she dries it with her hair, saying basically, Jesus, I love you. I adore you. You are worth everything. You're worth everything. Our music team will come. I've got to close. I read the story about a little nine-year-old boy living in the rural part of Tennessee. One day, the, a church that was in that community who had a bus program, and this was back in early 80s, was going, knocking on doors and inviting people to come to church and they were starting with a house as closest to the church, and this house was only about a mile from the church. And they went to the door, and bust the pastor did, and he knocked on the door. And it was on a Saturday, and a little boy opened the door, about nine years old, and he introduced himself, said, I'm the bus pastor from so-and-so church, and I'd like to invite you to come. He says, are your parents here? The little boy says, my parents aren't here. My parents go away every weekend. Just leave me here to take care of my little brother. First, he thought he misunderstood him. He says, he says can you say that again? He says, yeah, my parents go out of town every weekend. I, I stay here and take care of my little brother. He's just nine-year-old. He says, well, I, I just want to come and invite you to come to church. We're at that church right down the road. Have you ever been to our church? He goes, I've never been to church in my life. He said, you tell me you've never been to church in your life? And he said, no, sir, I've never been to church. He said, if you've never been to church, he says, can I ask you, 
Have you ever heard the, the good news about Jesus? Try to make the long story short. The little boy had been coming to the house and him and his little brother sat down on the couch. Little foam couch, springs. It was just rough looking little place. And that bus pastor with tears in his eyes shared Jesus with those two little boys. When he got through, he asked the little nine-year-old, he said, would you want to receive Jesus? The little nine-year-old boy and his little brother said, yeah, I do. He asked Jesus into his heart. He says, would you like to go to church tomorrow? He says, we'll pick you up. He said, sure. Again, because his parents aren't home. Next morning, the bus shows up, eight o'clock, knocks on the door and no answer. He knocks on the door again, no answer. He turns the knob, the door's open. He walks in, calls us by name. And next thing the little boy comes out of the bedroom. They're just waking up. He says, y'all want to go to church? Yeah, we'll go to church. He says, I'll wait here. Get dressed. They threw their clothes on. They got on the bus. He gave them donuts and drove them to church. They're sitting in the church, sitting in the congregation as the pastor's speaking about Jesus, and songs, the worship. It was just a special time together. And then came time for the offertory and the little boy's eyes were so big because he'd never been to church before. He didn't know what was going on. All of a sudden, these men come to the front, the hushers, the ushers, you know, and they begin to pass the wooden plate down the aisle and collecting, you know, monies. And he's watching it and he's trying to figure out what's going on. And then it hit him. They're giving money to Jesus. The plate's getting closer and closer and his eyes are fixed on it. He's, he's digging in all of his pockets. He's asking his little brother to look in his pockets. And he's got nothing. And when the plate comes to him, he just holds the plate for just a few minutes. And finally, he just passes it on. But he watches that plate as it passes to the aisle behind him and then the next aisle. And he keeps watching that plate. And finally, out of spontaneity, kind of like Mary, he jumps out of the seat. And he runs to grab that usher. He says, can I hold that plate one more time? And he takes that plate. And he sticks it on the ground. And he steps on the plate. He says, Jesus, I don't have any money, but I want to give you something. I want to give you me. It was just a spontaneous act of love because of what he felt he had received. And friends, that's how we're to intentionally love God. We've got to say, God, I love you enough that I want to give you my best. God, I love you enough that I'm going to give you what costs me most. I'm willing to lay my crown in glory at your feet because how do I respond to someone who loves me so much? Jesus said of Mary, he said, what she's done and she did for my burial, it'll be remembered as a memorial to her. Not that she knew that. And I've thought about this often because the next day is the triumphant entry, the beginning of Passion Week. And before the week's over, Jesus will have been crucified. But just think about this for a moment. Every step that Jesus took when he was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was standing in front of Caiaphas at that mock trial and people were slapping him and hitting him in the face, when he was back was being shredded by a cat of nine tails whip, as he was carrying the cross, as nails were being driven into his hands and feet and the crown of thorns pushed upon his brow, in everything... He could smell still the aroma of what Mary had done for him. Philip Keller, he says it best. He says, the delicious fragrance round down over Jesus' shining hair. It enfolded his body with its delightful aroma. Even his tunic and flowing undergarment were drenched with its enduring pungency. And wherever he moved during the ensuing days, the perfume would go with him into the Passover, into the Garden of Gethsemane, into Herod's Hall, into Pilate's patio, and into the cruel hands of those who cast lots for his clothing. It went with him as a reminder 
of what real love intentionally poured out is when we respond to him. Stand together, I gotta close. How do we respond? How do we respond to someone loving, choosing to love us that much? Delaney says, we'll sacrifice for what we love. Do we love God that much? That we say, God, I offer you my best. God, I offer you what costs me most. God, I will lay myself at your feet. I'll give you my crown and glory. Are we being intentional about how we love him? Father, we love you today. Holy Spirit, only you can speak into our hearts. No one knows us like you, Lord. No one sees us like you, Lord. I know this. When I was unlovable, you still loved. When I was undone, you gave yourself for me. And because of the love that you have shown me, you first loved me. God, I want to love and serve you. And today I make the decision and I choose to intentionally live my life demonstrating my love for you. I will offer you, God, my best, the best of all that I am. I offer you, God, what will cost me most. I'm willing to lay it down for you. And I offer you, God, my crown and glory. I surrender and I submit myself to you. You're worth it, Lord. You're worth it. You're worth it. Jesus, help us, Lord, and convict us. If we're still measuring out your worth, we've not seen your worth at all. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask a quick, quick question. I know we got to close. How many will lift your hands and say, Pastor Larry, the Lord is speaking to me about something right now. When it comes to my life and how I respond to God about the best, about what costs me most, about laying my crown. I've been living selfishly. I've been living more for myself. And God is speaking to me. I, I, I need to look. I want to show God how much I love him. It's not about works. It's about the outflow of the heart. Say, so God's speaking to me about something. Would you slip your hand up right where he's at? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I want to find a place of prayer. Can we find a place before we go? I know Bible study is beginning and Pastor Larry's over time, but can we find a place of prayer? Can we come and just get on our knees before the Lord like Mary? Say, God, I'm willing to offer you the best. Offer you what costs me most. I offer you my crown and glory. I love you because you love me. Can we find a place all over this building? Can we come? Come and kneel. Come and stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's all I have for. I lay it at your feet. It's less than you deserve. You're far more beautiful. More precious than the oil, the sum of my desires, and the fullness of my joy. This 
Tyler Bastard Joy is all I have. 